At this time, will you help me welcome Pastor Paul? Thanks, Lance. Uh, there was a line in that song kind of stu- stood out to me because it's speaking. It's kind of saying what I'm going to be touching tonight about the man in the prison with regrets. Um, by the end of this message, you'll understand what I mean, why it stood out to me, because um, I'm, actually, I'm actually going to be talking about that. Um, if you've got your Bible tonight, would you turn to Proverbs 28, verse 8, one verse. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Let me read it once more. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I've called this message tonight three men in Scripture that were very remorseful for their sin, but ended up in hell. Um, This is a very sobering message tonight. Um, But I want you to listen and listen very carefully because We live in a day where there's a lot of misunderstanding about salvation. A lot of misunderstanding uh, about how does somebody experience eternal life. And I do believe tonight we'll remove a lot of ambiguity if there's any exists in this house. One of the major problems with living in our day is this. We live in a day where there is such a misconception and confusion about who and what a Christian actually is. Would you agree? Um, you could get 10 people out there outside Walmart and you could get 10 different opinions about what a Christian is. That's how confused it is today. Um, And that is because many foolishly think they have the right to personally define what constitutes salvation. That to me is not only folly, but it's arrogance to think that we can tell God what salvation is. Or how do we get to heaven? Sinful men normally do this to accommodate their own sinful lifestyle. I'm sure you've experienced it in the workplace. Or if you talk to people out there about Christianity or salvation. Somebody will say, well, that's my opinion's this. And you share the word of God. They say, well, I don't agree with that. I believe it's this. Um, Many invent their own moral codes to appease their own conscience. And their own requirements for making it to heaven. Not surprisingly, they do they place the pole completely different to where God places the pole. Um, so why would anybody, by the way, who calls themselves a Christian, think that they can ignore God's word or improve upon God's commands and his demands? Why would anybody think they could do that? To me, if you're going to be a Christian, then you're going to go by God's word. Amen? Does that make sense? The issue is the ungodly struggle with this book. Uh, They have no or little desire to read God's love letter to mankind. If they do read it, if they take the time to actually read this book and to find out what God says about salvation and eternal life, um, they refuse to submit to it and accept it. They try to force their own opinions into the book or they alter it, or dilute it, or delete it, and just say, oh, well, I don't care for that. Brother, sister, we take the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation as the Word of God. We accept it all. There's no contradictions in here. There's no confusion. Um, For anybody to mess about with the Word of God, to me, is the height of foolishness. All they succeed in doing is writing their own Bible. If you put a plus on the gospel, you get another gospel. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 warns us, Ye shall not add on to the word which I have commanded you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. That there is pretty emphatic. A.W. Tozer rightly says this, The essence of sin is rebellion against divine authority. That's the essence of sin. I can do whatever I want to do. Even though God says this, I'm going to do this. The Bible 2,000 years ago warned us of a day 
that was approaching near the end. And listen to what it says how men will act. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. And I want you to hear me tonight. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned onto fables or fairy stories or their own different ideas. I put it to you, we're living in such a day. We're there. I want to make a big speak tonight. I personally believe that there's two main reasons why many refuse to submit to this book. And that is because it exposes their hypocrisy and it requires them to change. When the gospel is preached, when they open this book, would you agree that if you're living a double life, this book will expose it? That's my experience. I open this book, and I can tell you what, if there's anything wrong in my life, and there normally is, God will put his finger right on it and say, you need to change. Okay, so I'm telling you there's a reason why people change the word of God. Because it's just a mirror. It's a mirror and it shows you exactly where you are. Most unsaved people have no remorse today for their sin. I have never seen a day like it where people will justify their rebellion. Don't you tell me what I can do. That's the mantra of the hour. Gone are the days like 50 years ago where most people seem to have a conscience about sin and an awareness about sin. And even people who weren't born again, they were God-fearing people. Even to the stage of a Sunday. Sunday was the Lord's Day. But <clears throat> today, Sunday is just another day. We're living in a day where anything goes. The extremity, the availability, and the arrogance of sin today is breathtaking. It's literally breathtaking. You talk to people and it's like, really? It's like, do you really think that that's okay? And people will argue from their own feelings and their own opinions what they feel is right. They do not even regret their destructive lifestyle. You confront them on certain things and they don't even feel bad. They love their sin. They defend their sin. And I would even go further. They promote their sin. You have people that call themselves even born again believers today that will promote sin, willful rebellion against God, and still think that they're born again. That to me is shocking. Saying that, there are unsaved people that genuinely feel bad about their sin. Do you know that? Do you know that? There's genuine unbelievers out there that feel bad about their sin. They know what they're doing is wrong, but they never seem to come to the place of repentance. We have a habit of defining um, regret and remorse as salvation. We say, well, that, that person feels bad for their sin, and we put the Christian cap on them. Um, I'm here to tell you tonight, being regretful for your sin, being remorseful for your sin is not repentance. You know, when we, we see people there and we're like, oh, I think they're in heaven. I think Jimmy's in heaven. Or Jemima's in heaven. And it's like, yeah, she felt bad about her sin. Well, that's not enough, brother, sister. Feeling bad about your sin is not enough. God is looking for more than regrets and remorse. He's looking for repentance. The reality is to repent would require them to change. They would have to let Jesus take control of their life. But that is a bridge too far. 
It is the issue of repentance that divides true saving faith from religious faith. Repentance is not just hating your sin, but turning from it to the only one who can forgive that sin. There has to be a relinquishing of sin and saying, you know what, I, that sin is too dark and grievous to me. I can't keep living there. I need to let that go. By the way, there's a lot of dead churches out there you could go to and they'll prick your conscience about sin. We were a few weeks ago in Vermont. I was talking to people in Vermont and the church they went to, they said, oh, every time you come out of church, you feel bad. You feel guilty. You feel ashamed because of your sin. They'll put you in a guilt trip. And they can even cause you to walk in condemnation because of your sin. Would you agree? Would you agree that there's religious people out there that feel regretful and remorseful about their sin? Or do you think only born-again believers do that? I've seen religious people come into services like this. Honestly, there's many people. I was thinking about it today. There's many people have come into Decatur on a Sunday night. And have responded to the gospel because they felt bad about their sin. But where are they tonight? They're nowhere with God. Nowhere with God. Living in sin. Living in their lifestyle. God just exposed who they were. But do you know what? What happened? The word of God was stolen from them by the fowls of the air or demons. That's what the Bible says. That what happens, unless you, that word is applied to your heart, the files of the air will steal the word. And it just loses its impact. It doesn't produce fruit. It doesn't produce life. Warren Wearsby, who's a well-known Christian writer, says, suggests that a distinction can be made between regret, remorse, and repentance. Regret is that activity of the mind or the intellect that causes us to say, why did I do that? Remorse touches us a little bit deeper, causing us to feel disgust and pain, involving both the intellect and the heart, but not causing us to change our ways. True repentance brings in the third aspect of our minds, our will. To truly repent, one must have a change of will or godly sorrow, which is the catalyst that brings true repentance. I wonder before we go any further tonight, have you experienced true repentance? You, you might say to me, well, I know people um, out there, they, they know the catechism off by heart. They believe the catechism word for word. They actually believe it. They believe in the divinity of Christ. They believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. He died an atoning death. They believe that he conquered the grave. They believe all that. And they're good people. They believe all the fundamentals. So they must be a Christian. That's the problem today. We, we have fallen into the, the mistake of this generation of redefining what this whole thing's about. James 2.19 says, the devils also believe and tremble. The devils believe. Do you know that the devils know that they know that they know that Jesus Christ is real? I'm telling you, if you have been involved in ministry, you have had to deal with someone that has been under severe bondage and bound by the devil, you can mention the name of Buddha and nothing happens. You can mention the name of Allah and nothing happens. But when you mention the name of Jesus, that demon knows where the authority is. Why is it when somebody stubs their toe, they don't go, Oh Allah, or Oh Buddha. Huh? Why do they always blaspheme Jesus Christ? Do you ever wonder that? Because the devil knows there's no name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. 
The faith that the religious possess is just an intellectual faith. Many today, they think they're saved, but they have an intellectual faith. They believe up here. They can tick all the boxes, but they're not changed. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. John Piper says about sin, Sin is what you do when your heart is not satisfied with God. I've said all that by way of introduction tonight, by the way. There were three men in Scripture that did actually feel regretful for their sin. And not only did they feel regretful, but they felt remorseful. And I would say that's more than a lot of people out there today. They genuinely felt felt that. The first person I want to look at tonight is Esau. It says in Hebrews 12, 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For we know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Why? For he found no place of repentance even though he sought it carefully with tears. Brother, sister, I don't know about you, but when I read that, it's sobering. Here's a man that's seeking repentance. And he's not only seeking it, but he's seeking it carefully with tears. Like today, we would put the born again cap and say, believer. But you know what it says in the word? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Esau had it all before him, but he blew it to fulfill his fleshly desires. It was not that he didn't want to make it to heaven. Only a fool would not want to make it to heaven. I mean, honestly, just do go out there and witness to most people today, whether they're atheist, agnostic, religious, Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever, and you ask them, do you want to go to heaven? I mean, it's 99% of people say, I want to go to heaven. If, and even the atheists will say, if heaven's real, I want to go there. I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven. If they're real. And if heaven's real. And heaven is real. Okay? It's not that Esau wasn't sorrowful and remorseful about his wrongs. He was. He just wasn't prepared to turn from his sin. As a pastor, I talk to a lot of people. And I hear a lot of religious people who'll try and justify themselves and say, well, you know, I don't have to go to church. And, you know, I don't need to do things the way you do it. Um, God understands who I am. He understands my lifestyle. And, you know, God's a loving God. Or... I've got my needs. God understands I've got my needs. You ever heard that? That, you know, God's like, hey, he's cool with sin. He's because he is so, so gracious, so merciful. It's just like, hey, you know, the God that I know is just gracious, but that God of grace is also a God of justice. God must punish sin. So if somebody hasn't went down the path of repentance and embraced Jesus Christ, then guess what? They're going to have to pay for their own sin. That's one of the wonderful things about coming to Jesus. You no longer have to pay for your own sin. One thing you'll find in Genesis 25.32 is, this is what Esau said about his birthright. What profit shall this birthright do to me? What profit, what benefit will this birthright be to me? You can really feel the heart of Esau here. He didn't appreciate what he was given. You know, there's many that attend born-again churches that do not appreciate the new birth. What what do I need that for? I'm okay. They may give lip service to being born again, but they are not a new creature in Christ. Um, Old things have not passed away. 
and all things have not become new. Really, the birthright means nothing to them. Do you know that most people reject Christ because of their fleshly desires? They'll sell Jesus cheap for a bottle of beer, for an illicit drug, for a sinful relationship, for perverted pleasure, for fame and fortune. Doesn't really matter what they sell Jesus for. They want a short-term fix for their happiness. And they forget that it will cost them eternal torment. How foolish. But it says in this passage, He found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. By the way, some people have confused tears and um, tears of regret and remorse as tears of repentance. You know, well, that person must be genuine. They cried. Some of the biggest hypocrites I've ever found are quick to cry. Some of the biggest criminals I've ever met will tear up right away. I'm telling you, you have to bring them in tissues and all. They're crying so much. I'm like, okay, if, you, if you're taken in by all that stuff, then that may seem impressive. But God's looking more than just tears. You know, you know what's terrible about Esau? And every time, I, I, every time that I, I, I look at Esau in the Bible and read it or preach on it, do you know what's terrible? His heritage was the best. This man Esau couldn't have, have had a richer heritage. You know, a lot of us appreciate, I appreciate the fact that my parents were believers. I appreciate the fact that my grandparents were believers. I appreciate that my great-grandmother was a believer. But this guy hits it out of the park in regard to heritage. Think about it. His grandfather was Abraham. His mother was Rebecca. His father was Isaac. His brother was Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here he's in the middle of that family. A rich family. He had the best chance that anybody could have had. But he didn't appreciate it. He didn't appreciate what God had given him. He ended up a child of the devil. And he went to hell. Could I say tonight, it doesn't matter how rich your heritage is in your family. I don't care how blessed you are. You will not get into heaven by the, the richness of your family. The richness of the spiritual heritage. Augustine once said, He who beats his heart but does not mend his ways does not remove his sin, but hardens them. Is there someone here tonight like Esau? You're refusing your spiritual inheritance because of your fleshly desires. Let this story be a warning to you tonight. The second person I want to look at tonight is Herod. I've talked about Herod over the years quite a few times. I don't need to tell you with Herod what happened. Um... Herod threw a party one night. And at that party, of course, there was a damsel who was dancing and caught his eye. And he ple- it actually says that that damsel pleased Herod. He was taken up by this girl. And the king said to the damsel, Ask of me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And he swore unto her, whatever you ask, I will give it to you up to 50% of my kingdom. You can ask anything and I'll give you everything, but I'll draw the line at 50% of my kingdom. Would you agree? That's a big speak. This must have been some girl. Amen? Hey, let's be real tonight, guys. Like, was this guy out of his mind? 
This was a guy, by the way, that sat in meetings like this and heard John the Baptist gladly and realized he was a just man. So what happened then? He says this to the girl. What she, go- she went and talked to her mama. And Mama, what, what do you think I should ask for? I mean, of all the things you could ask for back in the day, what did she ask for? John the Baptist's head on a platter. Isn't that unbelievable? Isn't that unreal? And do you know what it says? The king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sake which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head be brought And he went and beheaded him in the prison. That was the end of John the Baptist in this earthly life. Herod's weakness for women cost him dearly. It cost him his soul. He was so bound by sin that he murdered the great John the Baptist. When Herod was trapped by his own words, he was extremely dejected. I want you to hear it. It says the king was exceeding sorry. He was exceedingly sorry. This guy wasn't just regretting his decision. He was remorseful. He felt terrible. Would you agree? He was sad. But there was no repentance. He didn't overturn his decision. There's no turning away from sin. This tells me being sorry for your sin is not enough. You must abandon your sin. But the deed was done. And even though he was remorseful, when Jesus met him a few years later, do you know that Jesus wouldn't even talk to him? Herod had missed his chance. It was over. Is there someone like Herod here tonight? You're running around with the wrong company. And it's affecting who you are. Let this story be a warning to you. I'm telling you, our company can define who we are and where we end up for all eternity. Is it worth it? Is an illicit relationship worth it? The third person I want to look at tonight is Judas Iscariot. He is known throughout the nations, throughout history, throughout the world as the most famous betrayer that ever lived. Even the world, when somebody backstabs somebody out there, do you know what they call them? A Judas. Or that guy did a Judas on him. This man is infamous. But a lot of people failed to know that he was remorseful for what he did. He regretted it. He was remorseful. But was it enough? No. Matthew 27, verse 3 tells us, Then Judas, which had betrayed Jesus, when he saw that he was condemned, it said said in the King James, James, and I'll, I'll explain this in a minute, repented himself. And brought again the six or the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned. Even you he had sinned. I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself. This wicked man, he felt bad. Judas couldn't handle the enormity of his sin. The word repented here, and I double-checked it um, yesterday, it actually means remorseful. Um, In fact, the New King James Version puts it better. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing 
that he had been condemned was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver. Judas felt bad for what he had done. He felt terrible for his sin. I'm telling you, as I'm reading this, I'm going like, if only we lived in a day like that where people felt bad for their sin, but they don't. People don't even feel that today. They're going about saying, I'm born again. They don't feel bad for their sin. There's no regret. There's no remorse. Brother, sister, there's no repentance. Hell is full of people who have regrets and remorse, but it didn't cut it. Just as, as a pastor, as a Christian, my concern tonight, as I read these three examples, is this. Many good Christians would have counted these actions as been good enough to put the Christian cap on these guys. Surely the sincerity of their regrets was enough. They were therefore saved. No. It has been said, remorse is being sorry for your sin. Repentance is being sorry enough to stop. It is not enough to regret it. It's not enough to feel sorry for it. John MacArthur says in his New Testament commentary about Judas, as Judas watched Jesus being carried away to Pilate, the full enormity of his treachery finally began to dawn on him. The sight was devastating to Judas, more than even his money-hungry mind, his sordid soul, and his seared conscience could deal with. He felt remorse as he began to experience the intense, excruciating pain that is unique to profound guilt. He concludes, Judas's remorse was not prompted by God to lead to repentance, but only to guilt and despair. Proof that Judas's sorrow was ungodly and selfish is seen in the fact that he made no effort to defend or rescue Jesus. He had no desire to vindicate or save Jesus, but only to salve his own conscience, which he attempted to do by returning the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Maybe the religious said, oh, they're sign of restitution. Huh? He come and he give the money back. He wouldn't take the money back. But that wasn't enough. We know the Bible says that Judas went to his own place. So we even have to be careful when it comes to restitution. Billy Graham said this about Judas. Judas was not forgiven for his betrayal of Jesus. And one reason is because he could not bring himself to repent of the sin he had committed. What a tragedy, Billy Graham says. Judas had been with Jesus most of his ministry, hearing him teach and seeing his miracles. And yet Judas never committed his life to Jesus and lived only for himself. He continues, his story stands as a sober warning for all time, reminding us of the dangers of superficial belief in Jesus. And he, he finishes with this. Jesus said of his disciples, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction. Judas's rejection of Christ secured his ultimate fate of eternal punishment in hell. So as I close. So if you think the wicked do not have regrets. You want to visit the local prison. Go to your local prison. Do a prison visit. And talk to those guys. And ask them. And I, I've been in many prisons over the years. I've been to prisons as a police officer, I've locked guys up. But I've also been there to testify and speak in a prison. And I've also seen a lot of 
born again men in those prisons. I've seen some of the freest people I've met in America were down in a prison, were prisons in Alabama and Louisiana. Them guys were free. They were locked up for life, but they were free because they had repented. They had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. J.C. Ryle says this, True repentance begins with the knowledge of sin. It goes on to work sorrow for sin. It leads to the confession of sin before God. It shows itself before man by a thorough breaking off from sin. It results in producing a habit of deep hatred for all sin. Brother, sister, do you have a deep hatred for all sin? Now, I'm not asking you, are you sinless tonight? But your attitude to sin will say a lot about your experience. By the way, another quote, it's not in my notes, but J.C. Ryle made this famous statement, a holy man is never content with indwelling sin. They have to deal with it. They have to bring it to the Lord and say, sorry, Lord. That's why we, I don't know about you, feels like most days I have to say sorry to the Lord. How about you? God, forgive me. I'm sorry, Lord, please. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why is that? Why can I not just conquer that, Lord? I'll finish with our verse tonight. Proverbs 28, 8. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I'm here to tell you tonight, the good news is it's not too late. If you can hear his voice, if you can see Jesus as the answer to your awful predicament, your warfare with sin tonight, and you can see that he come here to this earth because we are sinners, and you see in him as being a satisfactory status or sacrifice for your sin, I'm here tonight to tell you, run to him. Run to him. Embrace him tonight. Relinquish your sin tonight. Because I'm telling you what, either he's carrying your sin or you're carrying your own sin. One or the other. I'm telling you, there's not a greater relief in this life to, to get that heavy weight of sin and throw it at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me. Let us pray. I don't know where you are tonight. I cannot read the human heart. Maybe you think you were a believer because you, are, you have regrets and remorse about your sin, but there's another stage. And I would hate you to go to hell on a misconception tonight that somebody told you that that, that was enough. Well, never ever again will you ever have an excuse. You will never be able to bring that up as an excuse on judgment day and say, you know what? I thought I was saved, but I wasn't. A sign that you're a true believer is that you turn from your sin. The lovely thing about the Lord is when you give him your junk, he forgives and he forgets. It's a clean slate. You don't need to keep beating yourself up for another 30 years or 50 years. The devil may try and throw that up, that or remind you of what you've done. And I would say... You can live in defeat and be regretful and remorseful for the rest of your life. But that's not going to change anything. Once you give that junk to him, you should be free. You should be rejoicing. You should be thankful that you no longer have a past. That is gone from God's recognition. That will never be thrown up to you again. If you've made a decision, just ask the Lord now just to forgive you. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we thank you for your love tonight. We thank you for your forgiveness tonight. Lord, those that truly, truly give their junk to you and receive your forgiveness, Lord, experience eternal life. I pray that no one would leave this place tonight lost. Nobody would re reject you tonight. Lord, you have made a perfect sacrifice for our sin. And we thank you for that. 
In Jesus' name, amen.